I am David Hoffman, filmmaker, bird by my side, and I'm going to make this video about predictions. Why? Well, we live in very uncertain times. Maybe times have always been uncertain, but they're sure uncertain now with this pandemic and the economic factors and the political factors. It's just wacky uncertain. And people make predictions all the time. They make long-term predictions and short-term predictions, and most of them are wrong and some of them are right. How, how do you judge that? Who does that? And I've come up with a few ideas that I think might be provocative for you. So thinking of my own life, um, I'm not a predictor. I said cable television had to fail. Cable, the United States? What, that's crazy. Put cable up everywhere? I said video was ugly. Who would use video when there's 16 millimeter? You can see, I'm not good at this predicting. And most predictions, as I said, are wrong. So I've gathered some predictions I want to share with you. Stick with them because they're funny and they're interesting and they're wrong. And then I'm going to show you some predictions that were right. And how did they do it? Was it a matter of luck? And I'm going to say one more thing before I go over this list. Among these predictors who are wrong, you'll see these were important people. These were not anybody's. These were somebody's. Okay, so let's go. 1774, the British Prime Minister was dealing with the rebellious American colonies said four or five frigates will do the business of taking care of these people without any military force. Just tax them. <laughs> that was the Boston Tea Party. It didn't work. 1830, Dr. Dionysus Larder, a great scientist, an astronomer, and engineering expert said, rail travel at high speed isn't possible because passengers unable to breathe will die of asphyxia. 1839, the great surgeon Dr. Alfred Velpo said, the abolishment of pain in surgery is absurd. Knife and pain are two words in surgery that must be forever associated with the consciousness of the patient. Eek. 1859, associates of this guy, Edwin Drake, who was the first person to drill for oil, were recommending on whether or not he should do it. Quote, drill for oil? You mean drill into the ground and try to find oil? You're crazy. 1876, the great electrical engineer, Sir William Priest, head of the British Post Office, says, the Americans have need of this thing, the telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. Yeek. Funny. He didn't get that right. 1878, Western Union. The telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value. 1894, there was a horse manure crisis in London where more and more horses are being needed to remove the manure, which creates more manure. So the Times of London says, in 50 years, every street in London will be buried under nine feet of manure. In 1895, Albert Einstein's father was told by a teacher about Albert. It doesn't matter what he does, he'll never amount to anything. Also in 1895, the great scientist Lord Kelvin said, heavier than air flying machines, impossible. And here's Henry Ford's lawyer, who's gone to the bank to get money for Henry Ford to start the Ford Motor Company in 1903. The horse is here to stay, but the automobile is a novelty. It's just a fad, that's the head of the bank. These are important people. I mean, this is serious stuff by serious folk being completely, totally wrong. Almost silly. 1905, President Grover Cleveland, president of the USA, says, sensible and responsible women do not want to vote. And many women agreed at that time. 1916, Charlie Chaplin, vaudeville actor, who did his first movie in 1913, says, the cinema is little more than a fad. It's canned drama. What audiences really want to see is flesh and blood on the stage. 1927, the head of Warner Brothers says, who the hell wants to hear actors talk? Speaking about silent movies becoming talkies. 1939, the New York Times, TV will never be a serious competitor to radio because people must sit and keep their eyes glued to a screen. The average American family doesn't have the time for it. 1944, Emmeline Snively. She's this great teacher of models and a model herself. And Marilyn Monroe comes to her 
and she says to Marilyn, you better get secretarial work or get married. <laughs> it's really good. His Decca Records in 1962, talking about the Beatles. We don't like this sound, and anyway, guitar music is on its way out. Wow, that's a record company. Here's another great piece of predicting. Business Week 1968. With over 50 foreign cars already on sale here, the Japanese auto industry isn't likely to carve out a big slice of the U.S. market. Of course, in the 1970s, shortly thereafter, Japanese cars become huge in America. Ken Olson, the founder of Digital Equipment Company, 1977, just after Apple introduced the personal computer. Olson says, there's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. Now we're getting closer to the present, and I'm thinking of like Google. You know, nobody backed Larry and Sergey, nobody. And with Amazon, every VC said, selling books over the web, nutty idea, not gonna work. How could these people be so wrong? These are important leaders, getting it wrong all the time. Now we're getting into the environmental era when the predictions have been consistently, mostly very wrong and kind of embarrassingly wrong. George Wald, Harvard University, 1970, Nobel Prize winner. Civilization will end within 15 to 30 years unless immediate action is taken. Paul Ralph Ehrlich, biologist, 1970. The death rate will increase until at least 100 to 200 million people per year will be starving to death during the next 10 years. 1966, oil will be gone in 10 years. 1970, urban citizens will be required to wear gas masks by 1985. 2005, Manhattan will be underwater by 2015. 2008, Al Gore in his movie predicted an ice-free Arctic by 2013, then he changed it in 2009 to 2014. Look, I don't wanna suggest everybody gets it wrong, so I wanna honor a few of those, but notice most of these are long-term predictions. That is, it didn't happen immediately, but eventually, hundreds of years later, it happened. That may change things for these predictors. 1660s, Robert Boyle, the great scientist of his day. He said, one day, humans will transport organs from one body to another. Amazing. 1840, Alexis de Tocqueville. He predicted the Cold War. He said, there are now two great nations in the world, the Russians and the Americans. Each seems called by some secret desire of providence to one day hold in its hands the destinies of half the world. That's quite amazing. He's writing about 200 years ahead of him, and he's right. Then in 1865, the famous author Jules Verne predicted the first trip to the moon. He also predicted that this rocket would launch from Florida. Who the hell is this guy? Then there's Nikola's Tesla, who in 1909 predicted personal wireless devices. He said, it'll soon be possible to transmit wireless messages all over the world so simply that any individual can own and operate his own apparatus. That's a brilliant guy. He was right. 100 years later. 1988, the great science fiction author Isaac Asimov predicted we would use the internet to learn. So what am I saying? Not being a futurist myself, I don't know how these people do it, and I don't know how to judge someone who's right. I remember when I worked in Silicon Valley, somebody told me that Larry Ellison's great skill at Oracle, the reason he became California's richest guy, is because he kind of predicted 10 years out. He could see structures and see what was possible and predict 10 years out and be right. If you're a person who can predict the future and has evidence to show it, write a comment because I'd sure read it. I'm looking for predictions right now. What's going to happen to YouTube? What's going to happen to my videos, considering most Chinese people can't see them yet? Will that increase everything and change everything? Are we going to be watching video and little things stuck in our eye? Who knows? <laughs> I want to know. I'm sure you do also. Take care. Thank you. David Hoffman, filmmaker.